Good to see you guys here, and uh, I know that last week, Jessica and I, we were out of town, and I think quite a few of you guys were out of town. I got the attendance uh, report, and it was like, oh man, we had a skeleton crowd last week. That's somewhat expected during this time of the year. We're entering into those summer months, and you know, in the church world, we call that the summer slump. A lot of churches see a little dip uh, in their normal attendance, people traveling and going to the beach and taking family vacations, which is... Listen, all well and good, you work hard, you deserve it, have a good time, uh, but please keep us in mind and return, right? <laughs> Come back, and just because you're going on vacation, so you guys have done the, the taking the next step. This is good. You go on vacation, and then you come back to church the next week. That's always great, but I want to press you on one thing. Now, believe it or not, even though through the summer months, uh, attendance fluctuates a bit, now is really a good time to invite a friend. Maybe it's co-workers, uh, some people that you've met in your neighborhood, uh, family members that you would like to see uh, become involved in church. Now's a good time. Um, you know, I know that they might have to work it around their schedule and their travel, uh, but we always see this. Through the summer months, our attendance may sort of go up and down, up and down a little bit. But then at the end of the summer, say mid-August, late August, we always see this big boost. And that's because throughout the summer, you guys have continued to invite. And so uh, we see that boost toward the end of the summer. We want to do that again. And so now is a good time uh, to invite your friends, get them acclimated with our church. And so uh, just want to encourage you in that. If you're interested in, one thing we didn't mention in our video announcements, if you're interested in membership here at New Life Church, or you just want more information about our church, you have some questions, Discovery Class, which is actually going on right now, uh, in the conference room, which is down this hall and to the left, that's every first Sunday of the month. So just because you missed it today, if you're interested in, put that on your calendar for next month or the one after, every first Sunday during second service. So we'd love to have you a part of our church family. Just keep Discovery Class in mind. And just let me also reiterate tonight's uh, night of worship. Man, it's going to be incredible. We, we had our first night of worship back several months ago we did what's called worship in the round so the whole band came off the stage and was here uh, we're going to maintain somewhat of a uh, traditional setup tonight just to keep equipment in in the place but it will be um, no less impactful and inspirational tonight so make sure six o'clock that you're here and you join us in worship I grew up in I grew up in sort of an old-fashioned kind of church country church and and when I was growing up Nights like this, we had, we had what was called Fifth Sunday Night Singing. Anybody remember going Fifth Sunday Night Singing? Like good old-fashioned, you know, Fifth Sunday Night Gospel Singing. And that's what we did. And, man, people loved it. People you hadn't seen in six months would show up for Fifth Sunday Night Singing. It's, it's, it's good because, see, you know, worshiping through music, it really does something to you. It connects with you in a special way. Um, so tonight, I mean... We won't necessarily be doing good old-fashioned Fifth Sunday night gospel music, but we are going to be singing gospel-centered music. We're going to worship the Lord. Our team is going to lead us. It's going to be an incredible time. You do not want to miss it. So 6 o'clock tonight, you won't regret it. It'll be a great way to start your week. This is our third week in our series, Standing on Grace. A little bit different than some of our other series that we do. It's not topical in any way, we're not doing a character study. We are simply walking chapter by chapter through the book of Galatians, which is one of 13 New Testament letters written by the Apostle Paul. And so if you have your Bibles, you want to go ahead and find Galatians. We're going to be in chapter 3 today. If you don't have your Bible, it's on our app. You might want to download the New Life Church app, and you can always follow along with our messages on the app or those of you who purchased one of the Galatians study journals. Get ready for Galatians chapter 3. Um, as you've already probably picked up on in the former two messages and simply in the title of the series, grace is one of the major themes, if not the major theme, of the letter of Galatians. Paul, he preached the gospel to the people in Galatia, which we located sort of on a map, is central Turkey. If you had it on a modern day map. He preached the gospel there. He founded the churches in Galatia on this message. That salvation 
comes through Jesus Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, and no amount of works or adherence to uh, any type of law, but especially the Mosaic law that the Jewish people were accustomed to, no amount of works can earn salvation for you. It is a gift of grace. Now that sounds simple enough, doesn't it? And you might think, well, who would turn away from that? Who would reject the idea of salvation through grace as opposed to by works or one's own effort? Because Paul makes it very clear throughout this letter and elsewhere in the New Testament that salvation cannot be attained by keeping the law or a person's own efforts. He says no one will be justified by observing the law. It's grace and faith alone. So it seems to be a fairly simple choice. On one hand, you have the choice. You could try to earn your own salvation through good works, religious behavior, just being a good person, whatever you want to add to that list. Just know that in the end it will fail. Or you can choose to accept God's free gift of salvation by His grace. Like, that's a no-brainer, isn't it? It's the easiest would-you-rather question in the world. Those of you kids with kids, you know the game, would-you-rather Maybe you play it on the way to the beach or something in the car just to pass the time. Would you rather is just a, a basic uh, two-choice uh, question game. Usually neither of the choices are very desirable. Would you rather swim in a pool of Nutella or of maple syrup? <laughs> right? Would you rather be someone who always has body odor but just doesn't know it? Or would you rather be someone who always smells body odor on everybody else? It's like, no thank you to either one of those, right? So when we apply that idea to the message of Galatians and the concept of salvation, would you rather, would you rather attempt to earn salvation on your own knowing you will fail or receive it as a free gift of God's grace? Well, duh. I mean, ask me after service, would you rather go to McDonald's and eat lunch and regret it for the next three days or go home and eat what your wife has cooked for you? It's a no-brainer. I'm going to choose my wife's cooking every single day over McDonald's or any other place in town. And I will always choose grace over works every single time. But what is grace? Grace. We're talking a lot about it in this series and throughout the rest of these several weeks. But do we understand really what grace is? In its simplest form, we should define grace this way. That grace is God's unmerited favor and mercy toward undeserving sinners. That grace is received by faith in Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection on the cross as payment for our sin. That's about as simple as I can make it. And with that understanding of what grace is, you would think that no one would turn that down. No one would turn away from it, push it to the side, act as if it's not good enough, it's not sufficient enough, or, or neglect it in any way, or underappreciate it in any way. Right? You would think that. But if you think that, you'd be wrong. I have to admit, there are times when, when I neglect and underappreciate the grace of God. And I'm sure there are times, and, and we'll get into this here in just a moment, there are times when you are guilty of neglecting, and Paul says it this way, rejecting the grace of God in favor of something else of little to no value. Now before we get into explaining that, let me just uh, reiterate again. I've said this time and time again from the stage that I just want you to keep in mind as we're reading through the Scripture, especially in the New Testament letters like Galatians, that when the original text was written, there were no chapters. There were no chapter divisions. There were no verse numbers. And that makes sense. I mean, when you write a letter to a friend or an email to a coworker, you don't divide it into chapters and verses, do you? 
You just write your thoughts down. You sort of leave it up to them to decipher when you're changing gears and thoughts kind of thing. You might separate it by paragraph. Well, Paul, when he wrote the letter of Galatians, was simply a letter written to his friends. There was no need for uh, chapters and, and verses. Those things were added for our convenience later, just as a way of navigation, finding our way around in the Scripture. Now, here's why I say that. We're, we're teaching from Galatians chapter 3 today, but at the end, again, if there was an end, if at the end of chapter 2, Paul introduces this idea of rejecting the grace of God and how that happens. And that idea carries through chapter 3. So I want to read chapter 2, verse 21, where Paul says, I do not set aside, and some translations use the word reject, I do not reject the grace of God. For if righteousness or right standing with God, if righteousness could be gained through the law, any number of laws or religious activity, then Christ died for nothing. I'm not going to trade, undermine, or devalue the grace of God for works. If I do that, then Christ died for nothing. That's what Paul said in, in plain English. And now we can assume that the Galatian readers might respond to that statement much in the same way that we might respond to it. Well, Paul, of course not. Who would do that? I wouldn't do that. I would never trade the grace of God or reject it, neglect it in any way or push it to the side or, or treat it with contempt if it had no value. I would never do that. Well, to that, Paul responds in chapter 3, not so fast. Perhaps you think you wouldn't, but let me show you indeed how we often do. And in Galatians 5, he gives us five ways, I think there's at least five, five ways that we often show neglect, contempt, or reject the grace of God. And the first one is this, when we take our eyes off Jesus. Look how chapter 3 begins. Paul writes in verse 1, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. Now, let me be clear. Paul is not accusing the Galatian people of being stupid. He's not saying, you're a bunch of dummies. You're idiots. He uses the word foolish, which in the original text, Paul's writing in the Greek language, in the original text was a word that meant unwise. And it usually referred to a person who had the correct information, who had the ability to come to the correct conclusion or make the correct decision, but yet chose not to. Think about that. You ever been guilty of that? Your kids ever been guilty of that? They have the right information. They have the ability to make the right decision, but they just don't. Paul says that's foolish. That's foolish. He, he began Galatians fighting against this idea that this group brought about called the Judaizers. We talked about them in week one. Fighting against their, their false gospel. This idea that salvation comes through faith in Jesus plus, that's your red flag warning, Jesus plus, Jesus plus keeping the Mosaic law, the Jewish law. In particular, they wanted to apply circumcision to the Gentiles as necessary for salvation. Well, Paul comes against that. And he says, you know better. You have the right knowledge. You understand the gospel, but you're allowing someone else... These Judaizers, these false teachers, you're allowing them to think for you. It's like you've almost fallen under a spell. That's where he continues this thought. It's like you're under a spell. Who has bewitched you? Now, those of you who are old enough to remember that sitcom, like you're, you're tracking right. You're on the right, right path. Y'all remember the, the, the sitcom Bewitched? All right, so, so this... Uh, this wife, whose name was uh, Samantha, was married to, you know, your normal guy. I think his name was like Dan or 
something like that. I don't, I don't remember. Darren, that's it, yeah. Darren. Well, she had these magical powers. She was, she was a witch. And when she would twitch her nose, her powers would be, you know, accomplish whatever it is she wanted. If she wanted to control someone's actions, behavior, whatever, it was the twitching of her nose that would sort of release these powers. Well, for, for this particular context, it's not so much a twitching of the nose. The word bewitched literally means to bring evil on someone by an evil eye. A spell or charm. It's a look instead of a twitch. And now, most of you married guys are thinking, oh, I know all about that look. <laughs> like, I get that look all the time. When I get out of line, my, my wife gives me that evil eye. And it's like I'm spellbound. I'm hypnotized. I'm going to get in order quick. We See, the, the ancient Greeks were, were accustomed to that idea. They were afraid of this evil eye, this look, by which a victim would then be controlled or the victim of a, of a spell. Almost like if, if a serpent, you've probably seen this in like cartoons or something, when a snake sort of hypnotizes its prey you know, by, by looking at it, you know, staring into the eyes. and That's sort of the picture that Paul is, is using here of the Galatian people being bewitched. Being spellbound, hypnotized, and controlled by someone else. Wait, now think about this. If you are to come under a spell, under someone else's control, by looking at them, by getting that evil eye, how do you avoid being a victim? How do you overcome this evil look? That seems simple and obvious enough to me. You just don't look. And, and that's Paul's point. We get into trouble doctrinally when we begin to look other places than the gospel. When we begin to look at other things than the truth that is based in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. He says, in the clearest terms possible, I preach to you, I portray to you, almost like you can imagine, like on a billboard going down the highway, this huge billboard that, that depicts the crucifixion of Jesus. That's it. He says, like a billboard right in front of your very eyes, and you can sort of see the theme of the eyes developing in this first verse. I explained to you and demonstrated to you the death of Jesus. Stay focused on that. Focus on Jesus. Don't take your eyes off Jesus, because when we do, we are in danger with with replacing his work with something else. With devaluing what he did and overvaluing something else. The next way, and this is sort of ties in with this first idea that we tend to reject God's grace, is we begin to trust our own work, our own efforts, instead of Jesus' finished work. We take our eyes off Jesus. And then many times it's just a short distance to focusing on ourself, our own work, what we're supposedly capable of or responsible for. When somebody uses the term, the finished work of Jesus, what they're referring to is that work, you know, that, that mission that was given to him by the Father to atone for the sin of humanity by sacrificing himself on the cross. When he had finished that work, it's interesting enough that one of the last statements that Jesus uttered from the cross were the three words, it is finished. And at first glance, if you had never read that before, you might think, well, what is he talking about? What is finished? The work of redemption, the atonement God requires for man's sin, it's finished. It's complete. That work is done. To the Jewish reader, it would have meant you know, all of this relying on the sacrificial system and adhering to the law as a means to uh, be right with God. All of that's over. It's done with. It's finished because Jesus, who all of those things foreshadow and point toward Jesus is here and he's done the work and that is no longer 
necessary. So with that in mind, Paul has a few questions for these Galatians. Look at verses 2 through 5. He said, I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, you know, by keeping to some religious order or rules, or by believing what you heard? What did they hear? Chapter 1, the gospel. Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish? In other words, are you trying to complete and uphold your salvation by means of the flesh, that is, your own works? Have you experienced so much in vain, if it really was in vain? So I ask again, does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Does God give you His Spirit which is a result of salvation, God dwelling within us. He says, does that happen because you've been so good and you've kept all the, all the rules? Or is it because you believed the gospel message and God entered you by grace through faith? How did that happen? Which way? Was it an act of grace or was it an act of performance? Is it a gift or is it something that you earned? You see, Paul wants to be very clear about this this message. Don't reject God's grace. Don't replace it with something else, even if that something else is you. Because all other things lead to failure. He's talking mostly about The assurance of our salvation. The work that God began in us. Is it up to us to keep it? Is it up to us to complete it? Is it up to us to to maintain it and, and protect it? No. If I couldn't do anything to earn it in the beginning, I sure can't do anything to keep it safe. The Christian life begins and ends with the grace of God. In Colossians chapter 2, just to step out of Galatians for a moment, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, Paul wrote this. Just as you received Christ, how do we receive Christ? By faith, responding to the grace of God. Just as you received Christ, Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in Him. In other words, continue to live by the grace of God. Everything in the Christian life begins and ends. By grace through faith. Yet so often, so many of us turn aside from the grace of God to our own works. We make the Christian life all about what we do, what we don't do, instead of what Jesus has already done. We sort of grade ourselves on this scale. Well, I've done good this week, so I must still be a Christian. Or I've done really bad this week, so maybe I'm not. When in reality, if grace ever worked in you, what you do or what you don't do, and I'm not encouraging bad behavior, but what you do or what you don't do has no bearing on that. It's either all grace or none at all. You cannot start with grace and end with works. That's Paul's message here. It's like we apply to our Christian life this, this phrase I've heard over the years. What got you here won't get you there. Maybe you've heard that like in a work setting. That you always got to be uh, honing your skills, you know, seeking to improve and to grow yourself. Hey, I, I agree with all of that. But when it comes to the Christian life, when it comes to the topic of salvation, it is the exact opposite. What got you here is the only thing that will get you there. Add nothing to the grace of God because adding to it is to reject it. So we're talking here about how how do we reject God's grace? Well, we do that when we begin to take our eyes off Jesus and focus on something else, especially on ourselves and our own works and efforts. Number three, we do it when we borrow someone else's faith, someone else's relationship with God, As if it's our own. Now I'm talking again in a salvific 
context here. I understand there are times in our, in our life where we are, we're weak, we are tired, we are frustrated, our faith is shaken. And there are, there are some times, even in my own life, where I need a strong brother or sister in Christ who's full of faith. I need them to lean on, right? I'm not borrowing their relationship with God. I'm leaning on their strength and their faith at the moment. So I, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about salvation. I can't depend on my friend to get me to heaven. I can't depend on my parents or my grandparents to get me to heaven. I can't depend on your relationship with God to get me to heaven, nor mine won't get you there. You understand? You see, the reason Paul brings this up is because of, in the Jewish mindset, there was a strong emphasis on their connection to Abraham. In the Jewish mind, it was as if they believed because they were genetically connected to Abraham. You remember him back in the book of Genesis. That their relationship with God was almost like automatic. It was a guarantee. There was sort of a back and forth over this in John chapter 8 when Jesus confronted some Jews who it said had believed in him. And he says, if you, if you hold to my teaching, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. And they said, wait a minute, what do you mean free? We've never been slaves of anyone. We're children of Abraham. Now, my first thought is they probably hadn't read, uh, read the Old Testament because it's obvious that the Jewish people have a long history of slavery. But I think in their minds, they're thinking in more spiritual terms, being spiritual slaves. And They said, no, that doesn't describe us because we're children of Abraham. You see, their faith was in Abraham, not in God. And so Paul says, okay, let's, let's start there. And I will show you that even Abraham's faith, even Abraham's relationship with God was one based on grace and not of works. And so if you're going to be true children of Abraham, you need to follow his, his pattern. And so he takes us all the way back to Genesis and shows us that when Abraham believed God, when Abraham entered into a relationship with, with God, the works, the law, wasn't even in existence yet. So there's no way that Abraham's righteousness was accredited to him because of anything he had done. It was simply his faith in the grace and the promise of God. What he's trying to do is get them to understand that their most important link to Abraham was not genetic. It was it was his faith in response to the grace and the promise of God. You might think, well, you know, what's that have to do with us? I mean, we're not literal descendants of Abraham unless you happen to be Jewish, then you, then you are. But for the rest of us, like, what does that have to do with us? I think the overarching message here is this, that it doesn't matter what kind of faith your parents, your grandparents, or anybody else you're related to has. It doesn't matter how close of a relationship they have with God, their relationship will do you no good in trying to enter heaven. Every single person has to respond to Christ and his offer for themselves. We can't, we can't ride into heaven on somebody else's coattail. It doesn't matter if you had good Christian parents. Maybe your dad was a deacon I had a question of salvation on that one, but, you know, just kidding. But, you know, your dad was really involved in, in the church. Maybe your mom was a church secretary, one of the greatest, you know, uh, Christian role models that, that they could be. Your, your, your granddaddy was a, was a pastor. Hey, listen, all that's great. You know, you should be proud to come from a family with a line or a heritage of faith. But it doesn't make you an automatic Christian. You have to respond to God's offer for yourself. So that's what Paul's talking about here. We reject God's grace when we take our eyes off Jesus, when we begin to, to trust our own works and our own abilities rather than His finished work, and when we assume that we could just sort of scoot in on someone else's relationship with God. He says, no, none of that. 
None of that is, is sufficient. Each person has to have their own relationship. As one commentator says that God is a father, not a grandfather. He only has children, not grandchildren. Each person has to be directly connected through Christ with God. Number four, another way that we reject or show contempt for God's grace, we see this among the, Gentile, or among the Galatians here, is that we live under the past rather than learn from it. Again, he's talking about you know, the whole background, the context with, with Abraham and the promise that God made to Abraham. It was a covenant. He covenanted with Abraham, made a promise to him, and, and said that it was through Abraham's seed, and the word used there is, is singular. So one seed, through Abraham's seed, the promised Messiah would come. The one who would be and offer salvation for the world. You read that in Genesis 22, verse 18. In response to God's promise, which is a promise or a covenant of grace. Again, it's not a works thing. He didn't say coming is the law and if you keep it well enough, then you will be saved. No, there's coming a seed, a Messiah. This is a work of grace. In response to that, Abraham believed God. He trusted God. He relied on the grace of God, and it says, and it was accredited to him as righteousness. That's a very important point. It wasn't because Abraham kept the law. Again, because it didn't exist at that point in history. And so some people might push back and say, well, what's the point in the law? Especially if you were, you were brought up Jewish and you were taught the Mosaic law, you're like, what's the point? Paul knows that this is what his audience is thinking. And in verse 19, he says, why then was the law given? If the law is a thing of the past and the law can't make a person right before God, then why does it even exist? He answers that question in verse uh, 19 here. He says, it was added because of transgressions until the seed, the gift of grace, the Messiah, to whom the promise referred had come. He said the same thing, something similar, in Romans chapter 7, verse 7 and 13. He says, I would not have known what sin was had it not been for the law. In order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what was good to bring about my death so that through the commandment sin might be become utterly sinful. All of that to say this. The law serves one purpose, to condemn you. You say, oh boy, that's terrible. Well, no, not really. How would you know that there is a law against or it is wrong to do a certain thing if no one told you? If you didn't know. So the law serves to condemn us. But that condemnation, again, is something that is intended to move us in a certain direction toward grace. You see, when the law, when we are condemned, one of two things. We're going to have one or two reactions. Either we're going to try harder to keep the law, to do better in hopes that we might achieve or earn rightness with God. That was the pattern they were caught in. Or we will be driven to the cross where we rely solely on the grace and mercy of God. So the law is useful. It shows us our sin. And its purpose is to drive us to the cross. That's what Paul said. In Galatians 3, 24, the law was put in charge to lead us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. This was a part of their past. This was the Jewish heritage. This is what they, they grew up being taught, the law. And Paul says, the law was meant to be learned from. But you are in Christ now you're not to live under it. In other words, to be controlled by it, to solely depend upon it. Now, again, to apply this to us in, in a very practical way, maybe it's something else in our past. It could be, I mean, we certainly all have a past, but we, we recognize that our past, the things that we've done, the choices that we've made, the direction paths that we've gone through, they all have a way of shaping us and molding us into somewhat the people that we are today. But rather than, because we all have those things we regret, that we wish we'd have never 
uh, chosen paths we would have never ventured down, rather, rather than allowing those things to maintain control over us, to define us, to show or weigh authority over us, Paul says, let those things drive you to the cross and elevate your appreciation for the grace of God. In other words, learn the lessons of the past, but by all means, don't live there. Learn the lessons of yesterday, but live today and tomorrow under and by the grace of God. What a liberating message. Here's the last one that we find in the last three several verses of Galatians 3. We trade, we reject, we undermine the grace of God when we forget whose we are, when we forget who we belong to. Listen to how Paul ends chapter 3. Starting in verse 23, he says, Before the coming of this faith, this faith that is by grace, not works, we were held in custody under the law, locked up until the faith that was to come would be revealed. So the law was our guardian until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. Now that this faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There's neither Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You're all one in Christ. In other words, it doesn't matter, uh, you know, your, your heritage, one is not better than the other. You know, men don't have a better standing with God than women. At the, at the cross, the ground is, is level. He says, if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. In short, uh, Paul, I think, is stressing the idea that if you, as long as you choose to live under the law, as long as you choose to live under your past, you are controlled by it. You're obligated to it. It is your master. And he's saying, free, free yourself. Liberate yourself in Christ. Recognize him as your authority. You know, it could be some past sin, some rules and obligations that you were told that you had to keep in order to be a good Christian. It could be to a person or to some organization that told you, you know, your allegiance has to first be and solely be to us in order to, to truly be right with God. I think the message here in Galatians chapter 3 is break free from that because in Christ you don't belong to it or them anymore. It's in Christ, by the grace of God, that you find your place in eternity as a son or a daughter of God. It is in Christ, by the grace of God, that you, provide, you find your place in society as a brother, as a sister, in the family of God. It is in Christ and by the grace of God that you find your place in history. Because as Paul said, in Christ we're all, we're all spiritually descendants of God. Abraham. We're a part of God's redemptive plan. Isn't that incredible? Why would we turn aside from that? Why would we neglect that or devalue that? The grace of God. Through the grace of God, we, we are able to answer the most basic questions in life. Who am I and whose am I? Who am I and who do I belong to? The answer is simple. Because of the grace of Christ, I am in Christ. I am a son of the living God, united with all redeemed people, past, present, and future. Because of the grace of God, I am in Christ, and there I discover my identity. I find and maintain my footing, and I can claim and be confident of my eternity. Begins and ends with the grace of God. Add nothing to it. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I certainly understand the complexity of the message of Paul, the writings of Paul, especially here in Galatians chapter 3, as I mentioned in the first message. Um, 
verse, chapters 1 and 2, he, he sort of establishes his, his authority and relationship with the Galatian people. Chapters 3 and 4, he, he really dives in doctrinally. And sometimes, man, that can, that can be on the surface a little confusing. I had some, some friends of mine who went with me last weekend out of town, and they're reading through the book of Galatians, and they're like, man, this, this is difficult to understand. I get it. Be patient. You'll begin to put the puzzles, the pieces together, and you'll understand the big picture. That through the complexity is simplicity. All of what Paul says boils down to the grace of God and dependency upon Jesus Christ and his finished work, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. At the end of the day, that's what you need to remember. That's what you need to focus on. And that is what you stake your eternity on. If you've never entered into a relationship with Jesus or expressed faith in Him and received this gift of salvation, would you do that right now? Perhaps take this moment and pray, Dear Lord Jesus, I confess that I am a sinner. I desire your forgiveness and mercy. I throw myself upon the grace of God. I believe that you died on the cross for my sin. You were buried and rose from the dead. And I confess you now as my Lord and Savior. I ask that your spirit indwell me, live within me. And from this moment forward, help me to live my life for you. With all of my heart, with all of my being, Jesus, I trust and acknowledge you. If you're praying that prayer or something like it to express faith in Jesus, let us know. Write it on your connection card, which is in the uh, back of the seat in front of you. Turn that in at Connection Central. We want to know. We want to celebrate with you. For the rest of us, I hope that something that we've talked about today in Galatians chapter 3, our time of worship together, has only served to elevate your appreciation of the grace of God and what Jesus has done for you. It's an incredible miracle that he worked on your behalf and on mine, and he deserves our worship and gratitude for it. God, we love you. We thank you so much for what you have done for us, how you demonstrated your love for us through the work of Jesus Christ. It is only through his death, burial, and resurrection that we have hope for eternity, and we put our trust and our faith solely in him. May you receive the glory and honor from all things that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. Hope to see you tonight at 6 o'clock for our night of worship.